Good morning. As Tom indicated last Sunday, he is in California conducting a memorial service for his father, and he's asked me to be in his place at this time. I'm Doug Wright. Going back uh, a few years, I retired as the pastor of this church some, what, 33, 34 years ago or more. I don't know. I can't keep track of it any longer. Okay. But um, shortly after I had retired, the congregation was kind enough to make me the pastor emeritus. And so I'm still hanging around, and uh, I'm happy to be able to do this and do so without any honorarium whatsoever. It's a joy to be a part of this congregation, and I've observed it for a long time and appreciate the opportunity to share here with them. Stuart, do you have something to say? Well, I always have something to say. <laughs> so, but first of all, we're going to let Mary Lou start off so we don't forget her. You could possibly. We have a true dilemma. Choir met Friday, or Wednesday, and two people were gone to California to a wedding. Another person was gone to California to a wedding. And as you just heard, the minister and his wife are gone to California for a funeral. We have this many people in the choir. This many people are gone. So you get no choir today. This is an urgent, urgent plea. If you can sing and like to sing, we can teach you what you need to know to sing. So please show up if you can at 4.30 Wednesday, please, extra please. Well, this last Thursday, we had our potluck dinner over in Swain Hall, and it was really nice to see a lot of people and get together and have some fellowship. There was lots of good food. We had a uh, program put on by the Attorney General's office, and that was very informative. There are still some flyers over there and some no soliciting stickers if you want. They left us a flyer saying that the City of Phoenix is having a shred -a -thon Saturday, October 29th. It's going to be down at the Phoenix College, and it's from 8 o'clock to 12 o'clock. It is open to anybody. Uh, there is a limit of five boxes that you can have shredded. Uh, no, the November Fellowship Dinner is our pre-Thanksgiving meal of turkey, ham, and all the trimmings. It'll be on November 17th at 5 o'clock in Swain Hall. The Sun City Ukulele Club will be invited for our entertainment. They're always fun to watch. We have our uh, awaiting Advent, which is where our ch church decorating. It'll be on Saturday, November 26, starting at 9 o'clock. There's lots of jobs. Some you can sit down, some you can climb, some you can just uh, sit there and point and tell somebody else to do something. So something for everybody. Uh, Heart Pantry sent us a, a memo or email the other day, and uh, they usually struggle at Christmas to get lots of uh, the packages for their uh, teens that they help support. And they are proud to announce that uh, they have somebody that is going to provide all those for them. There's going to be over 200 bags for the kids. However, what they would like is insulated water bottles for the kids. So uh, these bottles can go anywhere from $9 to $15. So if you're at the store and you see one, uh, buy it and uh, put it in the uh, hard pantry box over in the office and we'll make sure they get it and it'll be passed on. Joy of Learning is uh, Friday mornings over at 9.30. Uh, it's very informative and uh, people are really enjoying it. And uh, so you do not have to be a member. Anybody is welcome. Presbyterian Women's Bible Study is the second Tuesday of each month over in the fireside room at one o'clock. Again, you do not have to be a member of the church. Debbie Tripp is the moderator for that. 
For those of you that are not at here, that are at home, and if you need a ride, contact the church office and we'll see if we can't uh, get somebody to come by and pick you up. And I think last will be uh, our sister church, Faith Presbyterian, on Wednesday uh, from 10 o'clock to noon o'clock. They're gonna have several vendors up there. They are gonna be for uh, Benavia, Northwest Connect, State of Arizona Family Car or Care Program, and some other programs. So if you're interested or know anybody that needs to uh, have any of this information, let them know to go up to Faith. I think that's all I have. So Mary Lou, if we can prepare ourselves for, thank you.
Let us now do our call to worship, the responsive reading. Jesus said, I am the way. We believe, Lord, Jesus. He said, I am the truth. We believe, Lord, Jesus. I am the resurrection and the life. We believe, Lord, Jesus. I am the light of the world. We believe, Lord, Jesus. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. We believe, Lord, Jesus. I am the true vine. We believe, Jesus, for all that you are, we worship you. If you're able, please stand as we sing our first hymn, Our Mighty Fortress is Our God.
Now, if you will, please join me in reciting the affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, our Father Almighty. From thence he shall come judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us unite our hearts and minds in a moment of quiet prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, our Father, we know in our own weaknesses, and we know your power. And so in this moment of prayer together, we take our helplessness to your strength, our ignorance to your wisdom, our sin to your purity, our need to your love. We cannot decide exactly what we should do in life, so grant us the guidance which will save us from our mistakes. We cannot hear the toil of life, so grant us the strength to pass the breaking point and not to break. We cannot escape the worry of life, so grant us the peace and that passes understanding, which the world cannot give or ever take away. We cannot face the responsibilities of life, and so grant us to know that there is nothing that we have to face alone. We cannot solve the problems of life, and so grant us in your wisdom to find the answers to the questions which perplex our ignorance. We cannot find the right way, so grant that at every crossroads of life, your spirit may be there to direct us. We cannot face illness alone, and so grant us to know that you are ever and always present with your sustaining strength and your loving comfort. And then, our Father, we know that we cannot face death alone, and so we pray that you will grant us to be very sure that nothing in life or in death can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We come to you for strength in life and for hope when life is ended through Jesus Christ, our Lord. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Let us now sing together an old favorite hymn I hope is built on nothing less.
Today's reading is from the book of Moses. It'll be chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and this will be page 1 in the Bible. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that may we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, instead of our hymn, we are going to have the sermon and the Bible reading. Our New Testament scripture reading is from the book of John, the first chapter, the first four verses in which we find these words being written, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This is the word of the Lord. One thing I did not indicate earlier is the fact that in a little over a year and a half, I will have reached the magic age of 100 years. Despite this fact, I still get up every other morning, do 30 push-ups on the floor, and then go out and do a two-mile speed walk. Now, people ask me why in the world I do this, and I tell them, well, it's because I'm so old I don't know any better. <laughs> but this morning I would like to speak about Words, the words we use when we speak to each other about the word, one of the most meaningful, meaningful ways we have of conceiving of God. Words. Words are one of the distinctively human characteristics in God's world. Now, in years past, scientists have successfully been involved in teaching a few chimpanzees to speak. Now, I put that in quotation marks, but to speak by using sign language or by pushing buttons on a computer. And there is some evidence that other animals, notably whales, dolphins, and wolves, use sounds to communicate with one another, sometimes in quite complex ways. But the fact remains that speech, the ordering of words and the invention of words and the use of words to express the whole range of creaturely experience is one of the things that sets humans apart for better or for worse from the pa pa rest of the family of living things. 
Now, we take words so much for granted that we use speech almost without realizing it, don't we? That is, unless something particularly beautiful or particularly inappropriate draws our attention forcefully to the words that are being used. Now, when I was first in the United States Army during World War II, we used to have a sergeant who delighted in coming into our barracks every morning at the crack of dawn and then yelling at the top of his lungs, all right, you blinky blink, 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 blink characters, out of the sack and hit the deck. Now, <laughs> we didn't have to think twice about the meaning of what it was he was saying. But if that same sergeant had quietly entered the barracks and said, the jocund day stands tiptoe on the misty mountaintop, and it is time that you gentlemen be up and about your business. Well, we might have had some second thoughts. For that matter, we probably wondered if he was sane or not. Yet, however much we may take words for granted, we should begin whatever we say about them by emphasizing their utter necessity. When Gog, the caveman, was finally able to point at one object and say, tree, and at another object and say, river, the march toward civilization had speeded up considerably. Now, at that moment, you see, it was possible not only to notice things, but to share them and have a kind of power over them and indeed to begin better to understand and to celebrate the creation of which all life is a part. And yet words are not only necessary and a distinguishing part of our humanity, they are also gifts and they are tools of incredible power. The letter of James expresses an inkling of this power in these words. If a man can control his tongue, he can control every part of his personality. The power of words for evil so impressed the writer of this New Testament letter that he went to great lengths to warn his readers about the harm that words can do. But if this potential for evil is there, so also is the potential for good. Words can kill, not only by giving an order to push the button to drop the bomb, but also by attacking another's dignity and another's selfhood, or by reducing another's human life to an object. A label such as nigger, the enemy, creep, and when more subtly we use the words occupant, consumer, resident, 
voter, dear sir. But words can also heal and strengthen the word of comfort spoken in kindness or anxiety, the gentle word that lessens another's fear, the word of confession and forgiveness. Those of you, and I'm sure there are some here, who have lost loved ones, know what it means not to be able to really speak what is in our mind at the time. So, well and good, but for Christian men and women, words have a far deeper importance because to speak of words in the context of the Christian faith is to approach the very sources of life's meaning to draw close to God himself. The writers of the Genesis creation story understood words to be an integral part of the foundation of the world. There was in the first place God's creative word. The whole pattern of creation is held together by the refrain, let there be, and there was. God uttered the world into being, not as if he were a builder or a clockmaker, but as the Lord God Jehovah, whose word whose speech contained all the creative power necessary to un undo in the whole of creation, to usher in the whole of creation. The symbolic first use of words was to reshape to call to have growth with us as something but this was a part of existence. Now the prophets proclaimed God's will and God's suffering and hopes to Israel but when they did so, they didn't say, well, this is the will of God, or this is how God feels, or this is God's plan. What they said was that this is the word of God. God's presence and God's power made real through a word spoken and heard. The, then you see we turn to the prologue of John's Gospel where we encounter a further and deeper sense of the importance of words. That writer of the Gospel takes the idea which is found in Genesis that words, God's words, were what got everything started. And then he takes us a step further. God is himself the word. And Jesus is that word made flesh. Offering when we are speaking, these things are at the very heart of the deepest of all mysteries, the very nature of God and the very 
thing which this God entered into human life and human history is seen in the person of the Jesus of Nazareth. So then, when we use words, we are imitating the first and the greatest speaker, who is God. When we say we are made in God's image, is it not because we too use words? How else are we ever to get rid of the notion that most of us still have, however dimly, that God is really, you know, an elderly white male with a long beard, black, brown, white, yellow, male, female words, Speech binds us together and to God, all of which means that we have, as Christians, a particularly important responsibility with respect to words. Do our words show us to be indeed images of God? Or in our words, do they keep children from others and even from ourselves? Deep within the heritage of our faith, there is the notion that words are sacred things, yet how careless we are of them. And carelessness with words is a carelessness with life itself. For example, <clears throat> consider the number of people who punctuate their sentences with an unending series of, you know, uh, you know, you know. It's like, you know, they can't, you know, help themselves, you know. And so often what is happening is that a plea is being made for intimacy and understanding which neither speaker nor listener can be bothered to work at. Instant togetherness, you know? Caring has become too burdensome amid all the complexities and gadgetry of 20th century American life. And so we make these pathetic attempts at closeness, the pathetic attempts at closeness which we need, but at which we are so often no longer willing to work. And here, right here, the power of words is the power to betray us. It is our inability to express ourselves and the longings which we seem unwilling to fulfill. But more dangerous for human life in these days is not carelessness with words, it is their misuse. To say, for example, that one's previous statements are inoperative is to use the power of words to destroy meaning rather than to create it. Inoperative says, in effect, that the lie was unspoken, that it never happened, and that finally truth and falsehood are morally equal. What kind of a desert do we make for ourselves when truth and falsehood, good and evil, are reduced to the operative and the inoperative, the very foundations of civilization 
are eroding beneath us, and no words, no words are too strong for the danger in which we then find ourselves. And regardless of what the freshly scrubbed folk in the commercials may say, Canada Dry tastes like ginger ale and not at all like love. Our thirst is precisely for love and not for soda pop. But when we equate the two, we get enmeshed in the myth that both man can be bottled, bought, and sold. And we come to believe that man, that man and that acceptance comes not because God loves us, and Christ died for us, but that it comes at cosmetic counters and in clothing stores. Toyota saves? No. Toyota may be cheaper than some other cars and less expensive to operate than some other cars. But Jesus saves, and the difference is enormous. But it disappears as we use more and more of our words to place value on our possessions. And then there are fewer and fewer words left where we and God can talk to one another. You know, and it's not true just of this church, but of churches everywhere, they certainly have declined. And why is so much of the glue that holds us together, both the social order and the religious imagination, drying up in flames of violence and fear and disillusion and indifference? Clearly, the answers to this issue are extensive and complex, but an important part of the answer is that we have debased our language. We have misused our words, and so we have battered out of them their sacredness and their power. When most of us say, God, as a casual expression of anxiety or irritation, how can we then sit down with others and impart a faith to them? How can we ask them to believe in an expletive? Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. How are we to retain and pass on these utterly essential foundations of human conduct when thou shalt not has become the very model of rep repressive, authoritarian, unfree behavior from which modern people are supposedly liberated? What happens? What happens to the power and the sacredness of these words so narrowly and so foolishly misunderstood? These were an hour. They are words of power and law and love. Yet as a society, we would like to think that we have outgrown them as if they were the collective neurosis of a group of primitive Hebrews long ago and far away. Such things are the stuff both of our tragedy and of our peril. 
Yet for all this, for all this, as Christians, we are called to keep our words alive and shining and real, love, justice, peace, sin, forgiveness, pardon, and the rest. It is an increasingly thankless and difficult task, but let us make no mistake. The alternative is that we shall trample one another, chasing after the automobile that promises salvation and the soft drink that infuses love. As Christians, as Christians, we are those who believe that God had something far different in mind when he said, let there be light. And when that all-creating word entered into human affairs and died a criminal death on the hill outside Jerusalem, it was in no small measure so that automobiles should remain as automobiles, soft drinks keep to their appointed place in the refrigerator and that the God should remain the source and the heart of all our words. As we go about the task of living our faith, it is this truth that undergirds all, all that we do and all that we say. And may it ever, ever, ever be so. Amen. Let us now sing to the glory of God, lead on, O King Eternal. <laughs> 